Next on Viewpoint. The Founding Fathers weren't concerned about being overrun by deer. Guns and gun control. What does the Bible say? A pastor shares his viewpoint. Uh, there is a mandate, a biblical right. Everyone who's depressed knows this term, the black hole. There is a depression epidemic. This woman will share how she overcame it. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Gun control in the Second Amendment is a major topic in today's news, and should it also be a topic from the pulpit of our churches? Well, today's guest is a pastor, is Walt Shepard, and he says yes, it should be. He also holds a Bible study in a local gun shop in Ohio, which is probably one of the more unusual Bible studies going on in this part of Ohio right I, now. I would say it's quite rare, that's how long, for sure. How long have you been there? About five years. Five uh, we years. started with four guys, and uh, it just kind of grew through the years, and we, we run about 60, 65 guys come out, and yeah. it, uh, it's a great great group of guys come out. It's a how blessing. Did, how did you happen to start a Bible study in a gun shop? Well, the owner of the gun store uh, approached me. Uh, he's, a, he's a believer, and he wanted to uh, do something with his gun store to uh, glorify God, mm -hmm. and uh, so we just kind of uh, started talking and found out that uh, we agreed on a lot of issues. Aren't there a lot, not just people, but a lot of Christians that go, whoa, you can't be teaching, it's a gun shop. You can't be. Uh, that's amazing. You there, can't be mixing gods and God and guns. It is amazing. It's a, there's a uh, a pacifist attitude that mm -hmm. uh, Christians shouldn't talk about guns and and uh, but when you look at the scripture and uh, and look at the not only Old and New Testament but put it all together, uh, there is a mandate, a biblical right. Um, we have a Second Amendment right as a, as an American citizen, but we do have as Christians a biblical right uh, to keep and bear arms. But, uh, but do I, I mean, as a Christian, do I have a right to self-defense? Do I have a right to, to defend my family, or is it a responsibility? Well, well, the, well, the Lord Jesus Christ said, and he says in Luke 11, and, he, and I'll quote it, verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. And so when someone's armed uh, in a defensive position, uh, the goods are in peace. Mm -hmm. uh, his family's in peace. His children are in peace. His, uh, his uh, resources are in peace. But the very next verse says, But when he's stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor. And then it says and he, that he trusted and divideth his spoils. And so here's one that uses the, um, the, uh, the carrying of a sword for offensive. And he's taking peace. Mm -hmm. One that's uh, keeping peace is uh, defensive uh, to, uh, to keep his goods and his palace, if you would, in peace. So one is designed to keep, one is designed to take. So Jesus is very clear and, uh, that it's okay to defend your home against someone that would want to take from you peace. Now, did, 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 did people say, well, well, do not murder, do not kill, turn the other cheek. Did Jesus ever really say, arm yourself? Yes, he did, actually. When the, uh, <laughs> uh, over there in the, in the gospel, uh, you, you'll find that uh, Peter uh, was carrying actually two swords, mm -hmm. and this is right before uh, the crucifixion. And, uh, and, and he, he, he makes a, a statement in Luke 22. Uh, he says, and he said unto them, verse 35, uh, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, ye lacked anything. And they said nothing. Then here's what he said. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, what's that? That's your money, your wallet. Mm -hmm. He says, and uh, uh, let him take it. So take your money with you. Then he says, and likewise is script. What is the script? That's the scripture. You can take your Bible with you. But then he says, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And so uh, the Lord is pretty clear here. Yeah. If you don't have a, a sword, let me put it in our language. You don't have a gun, mm -hmm. go sell some garments and, and purchase a gun. Uh, for I say unto you, as written, yet ye accomplish in me. And it talks about the crucifixion, talks about the purpose of why he came. But we have a sin-cursed world, and it is clear, not only as it said in Old Testament, but the Lord Jesus Christ says, if you don't have one, go ahead and get one. Purchase one. And what I like, like about that scripture is I was look, looking at that in preparation for you and I, your, our conversation, is that afterwards the, the apostle said, yes, we have two here. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus says, well, that's enough, that's enough. because it's, it's a defensive situation. They weren't going out to conquer the world right. and to force people into converting to Christ by, by carrying a sword. They were, it was a def defensive purpose. So two swords was plenty. Absolutely. And, you know, there's an old saying, uh, when, when guns are outlawed, 
only the outlaws will have guns. Absolutely. And so uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great story in the Old Testament about the Philistines. Uh, when, G when, when David was coming on to be uh, the king of Israel, uh, the Philistines were uh, basically arraying themselves to come in and attack Judah. And, uh, and he said to Judah, and he, he was uh, concerned about them because they were very peace-loving people, but he wanted them to be trained in the most advanced weaponry to mankind, and that was the bow. And, uh, and so he was, if you would, putting a, a mandate out there nationally to have some good defense. Why is that? Because the Philistines wanted to attack. Uh, also, another story is the Philistines were uh, uh, was told that, uh, that they, there was no smiths found in Israel. Uh, that would be like this in our time. There would be no gunsmiths. Mm -hmm. And so the smiths were designed, they were, they were there to, to make the swords. Make the swords sure. And so they were going to come in and attack Israel again. And so the Israelites, uh, they took the pitchforks, they took their knives, they took their pruning, they took their, their garden tools, and they went down into the Philistine camp, and they took files, and they started sharpening their files and their, and their, their hoes and their garden tools in front of the Philistines. And it wasn't for the purpose of uh, being offensive with their weaponry, but to avoid a, a conflict with the mm -hmm. Philistines. So uh, the, the point that was, is being made is that weapons... Uh, are, um, are something that God is allowing us to have for the purpose of defense and uh, defending our homes, defending the innocent, defending our, our heritage. Uh, and it's okay. Uh, I, I, my, my point, I think, I think a, lot of, a lot of churches have backed away from this and they're following a false narrative uh, that is driven mostly by, by a left media that says these guns are horrible. And they're, they're, yeah, they're picking out the gun in this case. Uh, and I ask you a question, uh, how did Cain slay, slay Abel? God didn't really care how he did it. He didn't, he didn't name a weapon. He didn't say, well, he did it with a rock. I, I always thought it was a rock. Mm -hmm. I see this picture of Cain coming down sure. on Abel with a rock. Sure. Some people said it was a stick. I don't know, it kicked him in the head. But God didn't care about the weapon. He cared about the responsibility, of that, that personal responsibility. And it was an offensive attack. Yes. Uh, a lot of people say, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. If you want to have a, a handgun in your home, have one, but how many guns does anyone need, and why do we need uh, ARs, which are not assault weapons, but armor light rifles? Why, why, do we need, why do we need those things? And the answer is, we don't, it's not a need, it's, it's a right. It's a right. It's a, it's how many guns does, does a home need? Yeah, well, I mean, well, for at least Peter, uh, two were, were enough two for him. Two were good. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say, again, going back to the, uh, uh, the, the, the liberal media, that tries to paint an, an assault, uh, when I'll use their, their term, assault rifle, AR-15 uh, or AR-10, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that has a, you know, a, a high capacity magazine, and call them weapons of war. So let's go back to the, the, yes. the, the, the Constitution. If you go back to the Second Amendment, and it's interesting, I'll read it, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So they would say that, hey, why do you need these AR-15s? Go get a, a little 22, go get a 4570, and go deer hunting. The founding fathers weren't concerned about being overrun by deer. Right. They're being, this is a militia, a well-regulated militia. Mm -hmm. They, and, they uh, just they just been in a in a war with a with a dominating government. Absolutely, and you know this uh, this is this should not be infringed. And so any movement against this right should not be infringed. And so I, I always listen to uh, little key words like uh, weapons of or phrases weapons mm -hmm. of war, uh, or uh, or those uh, those things that try to steer the mindset of our culture away from this right. Sure. So it is a biblical right. It, I mean, we can go from Genesis all the way to the book, uh, all the way through the Gospels, and we can make a pretty good biblical case that it's okay for us to carry for a defensive purpose. But we also have a, I believe, a, a God-given document. God gave us that Constitution, and that Constitution very clearly states that shall not be infringed. That is a right that we have. And preachers ought to preach uh, 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 for this and, and inform their people that it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that weapon. Uh, and another interesting thought is our young people ought to be taught how to handle well, used to, firearms. There used, to, there used to be rifle clubs in high schools and 4-H and, and, uh, taught uh, marksmanship. And those, but anymore, that's culturally so, such a, an anathema that, that they can't teach it anymore. No, I know. But there, there are those gun clubs. But how do other pastors respond to this when, when they see you in teaching in the gun shop or when they, when they hear your rhetoric or your, 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 
message about They're uncomfortable. Uh, there are some that are uncomfortable. Some are saying, I, I like what you're doing, but my association and my church and my, my, my church members, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be behind this. Uh, and I, I would say to them that if you just take and graciously teach the Bible, and, uh, and we're not, uh, we're not uh, this very s strange group of 4% uh, of people that run to the hills and are an anti-government. I'm, listen, I'm for the government. I'm just for small government. So we're, we're, we're all on the same page. But there's also a personal responsibility. And I think the, the, uh, our current culture kind of emasculates men. We're, we've had a responsibility, not just a right, but it's a re God's holding us responsible for that. Yeah. Uh, you'll find uh, throughout the scriptures that uh, the Lord uh, wants wants us to quit, the, the, the King James says, quit ye like men. In other words, be brave. Mm -hmm. uh, our country should be run, and uh, we should have, we should have a, uh, uh, again, I, and I call it a feminization of the, of the manhood in America, but it's, it's, it's affecting uh, the, the thought process of our culture to where if you carry a gun or if you like a gun or if you want an AR-15, uh, you are an ogre, you are a, a chauvinist. And, and they, there's, another whole, uh, there's an, another whole political argument that, uh, that comes from that, uh, that kind of thinking. Uh, I would say this, our country and how it was founded and how it was preserved and what it was given to us uh, with uh, was, was built largely by a, a people that feared, this, feared God and loved this book. Uh, and, and I remember uh, as a little boy, I would watch John Wayne movies. I would, uh, uh, I, I, I would stay up in those days, back in the 70s, uh, they had, we had a little black and white <laughs> TV, and I just, I couldn't wait to join the military. I was, I was, I was so, even as a little boy, I, said, I can't wait to get in the military, can't wait to get in the military. And, uh, and I, I, I proudly served my country as an infantryman. Uh, but uh, but uh, our, our country has drifted far uh, from what our founding fathers were. And, uh, and I know this, that if we continue down this road and if they continue to move uh, a legislation through our courts that are taking our guns away from us or infringing that right, uh, we'll be no different than Turkey, uh, which, by the way, in 1911, they established gun control. Uh, and so from 1915 to 1917, 1 1.5 million Armenians yes. were unable to defend, defend themselves, themselves against a tyrannical government. Soviet Union, 1929. The Armenian that, Holocaust. That's exactly, and people don't talk about yeah. the Armenian Holocaust, but that started largely from a 1911 gun, gun control, control legislation. Right, right. Well, wait, to get back to the, the whole thing of, of guns and having one in your house, do we have the right even up to lethal force? When you look at the, the, the Ten Commandments and it says, do not kill, thou shalt not kill. How do you, how do you interpret that? Uh, well, it's not, thou shalt not kill is the wording there in the understanding. Even Hebrews will tell you that's thou shalt not murder. murder. It's, not, it's not an offensive, premeditated attempt to take someone's life or shed innocent mm -hmm. blood. And so, again, proving the case of a, a defensive use of a weapon, mm -hmm. not an offensive use, but a defensive use outside of war, because there's times you have to be offensive right. in wartime. But outside of that per parameter, uh, uh, the biblical use of what the Bible would call a sword is permittable in a defensive right. situation. Well, it, it, and, it, and it is murder. I, I hear it misquoted a lot as thou shalt not kill. But later on in those same scriptures, it says if a man sheds man's blood, by men his, his blood should be shed. The, mm -hmm. the things like capital punishment are, are right there. That Correct. It's not a killing. It's, it's, it's the, the mandate is against murder. Right, right. And so I, I just think the churches, if, uh, if the people of God uh, could, uh, could not, uh, not, be, uh, not be taught and steered by the culture, go back to the Bible, look at the biblical right, and there's several principles you can look at uh, from, from Genesis chapter 13 all the way through, and you can see how God feels about uh, people carrying weapons for the purpose of defense. He knows we live in a fallen world. Yes. And he knows there's evil out there. And, then, and the evildoers are going to take advantage if, if uh, strong men don't stand up. Correct. Strong men and women, in Correct. this case, don't, don't stand up. That's right. That's right. And I think the sin cursed <laughs> world, uh, the culture, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that perilous times shall come. That means it's going to get worse. And when the end is closer, the, 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 the society continues to deteriorate. And, and as we get into those days, they're dangerous days, they're perilous times. And so during those perilous times, we ought to be people that would take the armor of God, God's word, and spiritually engage in the spiritual enemy, but have a, a physical uh, weapon that would help you guard against physical enemies that would attack your home and family. After the break. 
It was sucking me in. It was calling my name. Why are so many Christians dealing with depression and can they overcome it? The magazine Christianity Today says that the church is in a depression epidemic. My next guest says she was a Christian suffering from depression. However, Carol McLeod lived a good life, married a pastor, she graduated from Oral Roberts University, but after five miscarriages, she began battling with depression. I look at your books, and every one of your books has joy in the title, almost every one of them anyway. How can a Christian be depressed? How did what? it happen? Well, for me, it was my circumstances, it was my hormones, but mm -hmm. depression comes at us from different areas, and Christians, we don't take an immunization mm -hmm. shot that, that immunizes against depression. It's, it's part of one of the battles that we fight mm -hmm. this side of heaven. And we do have an enemy, yes, and do. he's very strategic in how he comes at us. And so <clears throat> for some people, it is depression. For some people, it might be in their marriage mm -hmm. or in their finances. And depression can take a lot of different turns. I mean, you right. can have a clinical depression where it right. really is a chemical uh, situation going on in your brain. And there can be situations of circumstances, emotional depression. Uh, how did yours manifest itself? Well, um, as you know, I went through years of infertility yes. and of losing babies. And, and so <coughs> the depression that I walked through, Bob, was attached to circumstances, circumstantial depression or traumatic mm -hmm. depression, it's called. And also for me, it was hormonal because my hormones were raging mm -hmm. after losing five babies and the infertility mm -hmm. drugs I was on. So for me, it was a perfect storm. Both things collided. And uh, what did you do when you began to battle that? I mean, you're in the middle of fighting for babies. Yes. I mean, you wanted to be a, a mother against so desperately right, and knew right. it was a blessing from God. And then the depression kicks in. Uh, were there messages coming in, in, into your life that, was, that, that caused the depression or was it just strictly dealing with the hormones and the, and the, uh, the circumstances of the, of the miscarriages? Yeah, I, I really do think that's what it was for me. It was mm -hmm. losing babies. And as you know, I held four of them in my yes. hand. Mm -hmm. I saw their little faces. I, I saw that they were perfectly mm -hmm. formed, yet there was no life in them. And it was the hormones that I couldn't control. And I was in a deep, dark place, Bob. I mean, everyone who's depressed knows this term, the black hole. Mm -hmm. It was sucking me in. It was calling my name every single day. And honestly, the only reason I got up was for my two sons, because mm -hmm. they needed a mom. And, and who, who saw this first? Who recognized it first? Was it you or your, your husband and your children? Who, who recognized the fact that this isn't going away. This isn't just uh, the blues after, after the, the miscarriage. This is a deep depression. Well, it was my husband and I noticed it together. Mm -hmm. We realized that I wasn't <coughs> coping well, um, that I wasn't um, engaging in life the way I used to. Mm -hmm. um, and so we began to talk it through and we began to talk it through with a good friend. And then I went to our medical doctor and he helped me. And I also went to see a counselor who as well helped me peel mm -hmm. back the layers of my yeah. pain. And, and, but it was a long journey, it lasted about five years. But you sat down and you formed a battle plan. I did. I mean, you, you, gotta, you gotta look at all the, the, where the attacks are coming from, whether they're physical, emotional, spiritual, mm -hmm. and form that battle plan. Yeah. You know, so for people who deal with depression, Bob, this is what I say, I say, go see your medical doctor. Do whatever he or she tells you to do. Mm -hmm. Go see a great counselor and allow them to help you. But in addition to those things, don't ever forget the power of your faith. So that's my voice mm -hmm. in your emotional health prescription. Don't ever forget the power of your faith. Use all three to combat mm -hmm. the depression that's coming your way. And did, did that weapon sh change in how you used it during that time? Yeah, it did. So Bob, I, I realized it was my faith that was giving me hope. I, I realized that when I worshiped the Lord or when I read the Bible, something picked up inside of me. And so I would play Legos with my little boys with the Bible open between my legs. I would do the dishes with the Bible open on the kitchen counter. I would fold laundry with the Bible open on the dryer. I was so addicted to the Word and still am mm -hmm. 
that I would write Bible verses on three by five cards and laminate them and take them in the shower with me. Yeah. So I was never away from the power of the Word of God because that is really what delivered me from that deep, dark place. How long did that depression last? It I mean, lasted about five years. Well, in the middle of that, at two and a half years, then you say, this isn't working. I, I've got to find, I've got to do something else. Well, you know. What, what gave you the courage and the, and, the, and the faith to go on? I think it was because I wanted to be a good mom. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mother the two little boys that God had given me well. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, this was their only childhood. And again, I have a great husband who was praying for me, who was believing in me. I had a good family support group, which was strategic mm -hmm. in helping me. And what's, what's the best thing you can say to husbands right now? I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. I mean, your husband is a man of great faith, mm -hmm. but it's still a difficult thing for a husband to watch his wife go through the, the miscarriages, the infertility, that battle, and then in the middle of all that, to have the depression and... Uh, what can you say to husbands right now that don't know what to do? They just, you know, how, how do I deal with this with my, with, my, with my wife? She's not the same woman right now that she was when I married her. I don't know how to communicate. What, what, do, what do, would you tell that husband right now? Well, I would tell him to be patient, mm -hmm. to be kind, um, not to accuse, but maybe to ask questions. Honey, is there anything I can do for you today? Honey, is there anything that, that we could do together as a family that might bring some happiness mm -hmm. to your life? Honey, is there anybody you want to be with or see? Um, rather than accuse or fix, I encourage men to ask the right questions. So yeah. often we want to fix things. Right, I mean, right. when my wife asks me a question, I just, I, I'm assuming that she wants me to go fix it. Uh -huh. what, and and it's, that's not normal yet. It's, she wants me to listen to what that problem is that she's facing. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, service really helps a lot. So this might seem like a little thing, Bob, but... No woman's going to refuse a man who does the dishes. That's true. Who folds a lot, <laughs> load of laundry. Does cooking now yeah. and then. <laughs> Who takes the kids out to yeah. play. You know, serve your wife. Mm -hmm. Be in tune to what she needs. Do everything you can. Um, and, and just love her. Just believe in her. Communicate with her and, and, and verbally encourage her. Like I said, rather than accuse her, say kind mm -hmm. things to her. Honey, you're going to make it. We can do this together. We've got what it takes. This is not going to last mm -hmm. forever. And, and it, it didn't last forever. But it when did. did you recognize that you're on the other side of this, that the, 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 the sun was coming up again and, it was in, and there, there was a dawn? Were there more miscarriages after that? Point, or do, did they all take place during that depression? When did you realize you were coming out of this? I, I realized I was coming out of it before my circumstances ever changed. Really? Yes, it was before I actually held a baby in my arms mm -hmm. that I realized I was coping better with life. I realized that every day wasn't a sad day. I realized that I had so much more to be thankful for. And Bob, this is one thing that I wanted to say especially to people who are dealing with depression, because sometimes they think that I am Mary Poppins with the Bible, and that yeah. is not who I am. I am a girl who's been in the trenches of deep emotional pain, and I figured how to get out by standing on the Word mm -hmm. of God. And if it worked for me, it will work for you. But what I want to say is this. If you don't understand joy if you don't like joy sometimes when you're depressed hearing the word joy is like mm. fingernails on the chalkboard <laughs> of life if yeah. you know what i mean i say okay then just be thankful mm -hmm. today think of three things that you can be grateful for because thankfulness and joy are not very far apart mm -hmm. where, where do you start in this word i mean if somebody's depressed today Maybe they're not into Bible reading, they're not into memorizing scripture, they're not into Bible study, they may not even be in church, but there's probably a Bible in their home. Where, where would you tell them to start today? I would tell them to start in the Psalms, mm -hmm. be, written chiefly by a man named David, right. who dealt with deep depression, and he was verbal about it. Mm -hmm. He talked about the pit that he was in. He talked about discouragement. So I often encourage people who are dealing with you know, emotional um, discouragement, go to the Psalms. And you know, one of my favorite verses though, just from another chapter in the Bible, is Nehemiah 8.10. And we, 
we know this scripture, the joy of the Lord is your strength. strength. But did you know that the first part of that verse says, be not grieved or depressed for the, the joy, joy of, of the Lord is your strength. And, and so I, I cuddle up to that verse so many times in my life, Bob, because depression still comes knocking at my door. Mm. It, it still tries it? to get my attention from time to time. But the way I answer the door is through the word of God. Mm -hmm. And I declare that in his presence, there's fullness of joy. All the joy that I need this side of heaven is not at Hawaii. It's not in a box of Godiva chocolates. <laughs> it's found in spending time with Jesus. Well, that Nehemiah scripture ought to be one that they do laminate yes. and carry with them. Stick yes. it in their wallet or something and, and pull that out and, and, and read that. That's right. Carol, you, you, you do share a lot of joy across the country in, in doing uh, women's retreats yes. and, and uh, things like this, but also a podcast right now. How can, how can people find you? Yeah, I actually have two podcasts, Bob. One is on the Charisma Podcast Network, mm -hmm. and it's called A Jolt of Joy. joy. I know you're not surprised, <laughs> but it's a daily Bible yeah. teaching program that they can just access. And then I have a weekly podcast for moms called The Joy of mm -hmm. Motherhood. And they can get that at my website or on Google Play or Stitcher. But my website is justjoyministries.com. If you'd like more information about Jesus Christ or how to connect to a local church, go to our website or Facebook page. We have a lot more resources there that we can connect you with. Plus, I'd like to hear from you. Here's what's on the next viewpoint. A successful fashion photographer leaves the industry to tell the story of Jesus in a new way through pictures. You know, I would love to take credit for the photographs. Bob, I can't. These are so far above my pay grade. This was God from the beginning. Only God could create something like this. He'll share the struggles of getting his book published. Author photographer Michael Belt joins Bob. That's next week on Viewpoint.